relatively late in the essays in the third book we get on coaches uh his montaigne's uh consideration of modern transport for his time uh coaches are like a, like a stage coach of sorts a uh it's like a car without an internal combustion engine or in many cases wheels um well wheels would be for a litter and he sees uh he sees them being decked out, blinged out in modern parlance by a lot of kings around him, a lot of uh, royalty. The, uh, the world is getting very wealthy in Europe, uh, and uh, he's taking note. When people get a lot of money, they like to show it off, and what better way in that day or today than to have a, uh, you know, a sweet ride so to speak. And he sees all of these princes and all of these uh, burgeoning captains of industry trotting around town in these very elaborate and often very decked out in gold uh, coaches. Uh, you know, horses and uh, the, uh, the, the, the coach uh, pilot or whatever, whatever his name is, the driver, uh, decked out in full livery and very ornate and, you know, gold leaf uh, around the, uh, the edges of the thing. And it's, uh, it's a thing. And he's starting to look at that. And, of course, he's starting to think. And he's a, uh, he, the, the folds of his mind are always fun to watch, but they are particularly uh, sharp here. And you can see his, uh, his technique of turning an idea over and nudging up to it and bringing a reader along to it uh, is on, uh, it, it's a master class in how to do this, quite honestly, right here. Uh, he starts off very, very simply, as he usually does. Uh, it is very easy to demonstrate that great authors, or he seems to be talking about himself perhaps, uh, when they write about causes, adduce not only that they uh, what, not only those they think are true, but also those they do not believe in, provided they have some originality and beauty. And you can go into that a number of different ways, but it's interesting to me that he is starting off right there with this notion of a split between the superficial value of something and its inner value. Uh, very much, again, a Renaissance trope of the inner, the inside, the outside, the interior, the exterior, the visible and the unseen. Um, and he's considering that. And so he tosses in a quote from one of his favorite authors, Lucretius, uh, for one cause will not do, we must state many one of which is true. Eh, a little tongue-in-cheek there, a little whimsical on Lucretius's part, certainly on Montaigne's part. Uh, so, you know, yeah, drop a little uh, classical reference right off the bat and perhaps sets a tone. So then what is he going to do? Well, we all know what he does. After he sets one tone, he needs to swing that pendulum back and take a look at things from the other side. And so, of course, he goes to, you know, a lowest common denominator, humor. Do not ask me whence comes this custom of blessing, or do you ask me? I did not. Whence comes this custom of blessing those who sneeze? <clears throat> I didn't say that, but okay. Um, let's just say I did. What do you have to say about that, Mount Then? We produce three sorts of wind. I love that authoritative. We produce three sorts of wind. He's doing it very straight-faced. Uh, that which issues from below is too foul. <laughs> Again, he's back on the farting. Uh, that which issues from the mouth carries some reproach of gluttony. Now isn't the belching. Uh, the third is sneezing. I love the simple categorization, very Aristotelian in its organization. Uh, and, 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 and he is appealing uh, 
to a, uh, a very common audience right there. After going highbrow Lucretius, he's going a little lowbrow. Talking about farting and belching, for God's sakes. And also just the, uh, the simple contrast of the ideal of Lucretius, of the classical tradition, with the common and the universal of, well, you know, everybody does this. Um, it's a very identifiable trait. It is identifiable humanity. Uh, and, and it's funny. And it just sets that tone immediately of looking at things from these two different angles, the ideal and the common, and seeing how we can pierce into it and try and figure out, well, what's really going on here? What is that interior value? Um, <clears throat> And then he starts, he, he, he starts taking up the idea of uh, coaches in general. And he does it on, uh, from a very human perspective again, where he says that he can't quite uh, enjoy them because of the jostling. And he starts to get, gets into a little bit of a discussion about motion sickness, which I think everybody has experienced. And so it's a, uh, it's a challenge for everyone. And then the... Um, uh, when he says, you know, my, my head and stomach, tr I somehow feel my head and stomach troubled as I cannot bear a shaky seat under me. And that sense of queasiness that, uh, that comes from being motion sickness, which again, universal, well, maybe not entirely universal, but for those of us who feel it, uh, it seems, you know, not unlikely. Uh, you get on a, a, you get, some people can't read in a car, some people can't go on a boat, for some people, you know, going in a plane, especially a small plane, when it hits turbulence, can make you feel a little queasy. Uh, it's very common, very unifying in its, uh, its understanding. Um, but then he switches again from that, having looked at it from the common human you know, uh, my tummy hurts perspective, he's going to switch over again to look at the notion of coaches from a more objective military standpoint. Remember, he has some military experience, and so his, uh, his perspective is that of an expert. And he talks about the use of uh, coaches and transportation in general in war and how different, uh, different generals throughout the classical and modern age have exploited this technology. And it's, uh, it's remarkably straightforward, remarkably simple. And he's just considering this topic from a separate angle, always turning it around and looking at it objectively, studying it, um, taking note along the way. I, he, he goes through a little bit more. He talks uh, uh, about some of the great heroes. Mark Antony uh, was the first who had himself drawn in Rome and a minstrel girl beside him by lions uh, harnessed to a chariot. He starts talking about how people start to deck them out make them a little fancy, um, uh, sort of drawn, drawn by them in pomp. Uh, the Emperor Firmus had his chariot drawn by ostriches of marvelous size so that it seemed rather to fly than to roll. So here he's nudging up to this topic as, a, uh, um, as an example of ostentation, of gaudiness even, um, uh, of being a little silly because you get from the military utility of it to something a little bit more vain. But then, of course, he's going to back away from that a little also. He's going to say, well, okay, let's, we've nudged a little in this direction, now let's take another tack. And he goes to more of a cost-benefit analysis and says, well, you know, um, sometimes the money is better spent. The, uh, the cost of decking out a coach uh, is... Uh, why? What is... What, what better use could you put those funds to? And in fact, by spending money, a prince or a king uh, by spending money on these sorts of trappings, these, uh, these gaudy, you know, uh, gold-laced trappings, 
often stir up resentment among the common folk because it makes them look so different from everybody else. Yes, they are magnificent, but you know, what are you really doing for me? This has been a problem uh, from the ancient era until the modern day, but it's a it's an issue that he's just sort of nudging into here. And he talks about, you know, uh, wouldn't that be better spent on something that could be more universally enjoyed? That money, those funds, can be spent on something, something that makes everybody's life better, perhaps like, and he talks about infrastructure. Uh, if it were spent on ports, harbors, fortifications and walls, on sumptuous buildings, churches, hospitals, colleges, and the improvement of streets and roads, uh, the king or the leader or whoever is dispensing this money would get a lot more for his buck for that because he would engender uh, a, a sense of gratitude from his people. They would respect him more. They would um, perhaps even be more willing to um, to fight for him, to go and conquer more uh, land, perhaps to pay more taxes. It would give a sense of um, value that the people could share. And a good king or prince would be prudent to invest in that so that they can go and expand their empire perhaps or their national borders or their treasuries even and just uh spread it around um and it it takes the the essay montaigne takes a turn into more direct advice to princes where it starts to feel almost like machiavelli and you're uh and and he's saying that you know this is what a smart leader does he doesn't necessarily spend it on gaudy trappings for himself um trying to always seem above everyone but rather spend it liberally to uh incur some sense of national pride of unity of respect for the monarch and uh, uh you get a little emotional buy-in and here uh, they talk about uh, a, a little story between uh, Cretius and Cyrus. And uh, Cyrus, the young prince, has been spending a lot of money. And uh, people are calling him to account for it. And whereupon Cyrus said, I am no less in love with riches than other princes and am rather a more careful manager of them. Uh, you see how small a cost I have acquired. At how, at how small a cost I have acquired the inestimable treasure of so many friends and how much more tre more faithful treasures they are to me than mercenary men without obligation, without affection would be, and how much better my wealth is lodged in than in coffers where it could call down upon me the hatred, envy, and contempt of other princes. And here it sounds honestly like uh, Beowulf, where uh, at the beginning, of Beowulf, while Beowulf himself is uh, later her heralded as this, Hrothgar is told that he is uh, he is a good king because he gives it back. He gets in lots of treasure, but he shares it among his men. He dispenses it, and that brings uh, loyalty. You're buying loyalty effect, in effect, but that's what a prince has to do. That is the calculation, the real politic of being a leader. You have to incur some favor with your people. You cannot just command them to uh, respect you. Um, you need to you need to show that you care about them, and you do that through material means. And so he's taking this little line, Montaigne is, where he is saying that, well, you know, uh, this is a stupid thing, decking out your coaches and going for all the other pomp and circumstance that is very expensive, uh, that's not necessarily the, the best bargain you could get for your money. And so he's... Uh, <laughs> He's edging towards, very slowly, very methodically, again, back and forth, always considering, empirically probing and testing and poking and 
you know, getting a sense of his idea, although he knows exactly where he's going. Uh, uh, along the way, bringing the reader to his real topic. And along the way, just softening the ground a little, preparing the reader for this more full-throated assault on what he sees, what Montaigne sees. And, you know, um, he starts talking about the new world, which of course is where all the money is really coming from. Um, in, in Europe in the late 1500s, uh, Europe was swimming in the cash that they were basically raping out of uh, the Americas. And this is where all the money is coming from, and this is what's really starting to gall uh, Montaigne. He took a good swipe at it in, uh, in Cannibals, and now he's looking at it on, uh, from a slightly different angle, a more refined angle, specifically about the money and uh, the real value of it. And so, you know, he says, I am, I, I am much afraid that we shall have greatly hastened the decline and ruin of this new world by our contagion. Our contagion, the Europeans' contagion. Now, you know, that is obviously uh, a, a literal thing because Europeans were kind of dirty and they brought all their, uh, their infections with them and just wiped out whole civilizations of people uh, who had no immunities uh, built up against those particular viruses and germs, but also the contagion of um, uh, superficiality of the, uh, the, the love of money and greed and the, uh, the luxury that comes with it. Uh, and, and he starts comparing, doing a little compare and contrast of these civilizations that are supposedly the cannibals, um, uh, where the comparison is not flattering to Europeans. Um, uh, just in, uh, in this one great passage, as for boldness and courage, as for firmness, constancy, resoluteness against the pains, hunger, and death, I would not fear to oppose the examples I could find among them to the most famous, them meaning the Americans, uh, of, of them to the most famous ancient examples that we have in the memories of our world on this side of the ocean, which is brilliant in its just little, in its little swipe there at, well, okay, those people over there, um, I would compare them to the great people who are all in the memories on this side of the ocean. So nobody, uh, according to this little sentence here, in Montaigne's calculation, nobody in Europe of the modern era uh, can measure up. But we have to go back to the greats of the ancient era, you know, the, the heroes, the legendary figures, maybe we can compare them a little bit, but it's just laughable, the idea that modern Europeans can be uh, standing on the same stage as the, uh, the leaders that we're finding in the Americas, which right there is bold. But then where he goes is remarkable and the way he goes there is uh is is, is quite it, it's extraordinary um the memories on this uh, memories of our world on this side of the ocean listen to this single sentence for as regards the men who subjugated them the europeans Take away the ruses and tricks that they use to deceive them, and the people's natural astonishment at seeing the unexpected arrival of bearded men, different in language, religion, shape, and countenance, from a part of the world so remote, where they had never imagined there was any sort of human habitation, mounted on great unknown monsters, opposed to men who had never seen not only a horse, but any sort of animal trained to carry and endure a man or any other burden. 
men equipped with a, ha with a hard and shiny skin and a sharp and glittering weapon, against men who, for the miracle of a mirror or a knife, would exchange a great treasure in gold and pearls, and who had neither the knowledge nor the material by which, even in full leisure, they could pierce our steel. Add to this the lightning and thunder of our cannon and harkbuses, and hark capable of disturbing Caesar himself if he had been surprised by them with as little experience in his time against people who were naked, except in some regions where the invention of some cotton fabric had reached them, without other arms, at the, at the most than bows, sticks, stones, and wooden bucklers, people taken by surprise, under color of friendship and good faith, by curiosity to see strange and unknown things. Eliminate this disparity, I say, and you take from the conquerors the whole basis of so many victories. That is one sentence. It is this long, cascading uh, waterfall of invective, of just decimating the European superiority, the European uh, illusion or claim of superiority. And, and, and you get this sense of, you know, everything that was coming at the, uh, at the Americans, at the natives at the time, who were just you know, standing there on the beach and seeing these ships come and these men come off and they're very heavily armed. And they're, you know, they have all of this technology. They have gunpowder, which they stole from the Chinese. But the, uh, you get a sense of that wonder and that awesome effect of it coming in. And it's all superficial because it is all, he's talking about very, superficial stuff. They're talking about the skin and the clothes and, you know, these little toys and trinkets that they're holding, guns. And they're, uh, it's, uh, it's confusing, it's bewildering, and he does it all in that single sentence where the reader is just sort of scrambling around, doesn't know what to make of it. It's just coming in and in and in and it's more and more and he's just trying to get through and figure out where it is. It puts the reader in the position of those people on the beach watching the ships come. It puts the reader in that position of overwhelmed. But it doesn't it doesn't scratch the surface of a real value between them because the sense that Montaigne is trying to give is that ultimately the Americans, the natives, were the better soldiers, were the better fighters, were the more honorable. And that's where he goes then. I conclude that if anyone had attacked them on equal terms, with equal arms, experience, and numbers, it would have been just as dangerous for him as in any other war we know of, and more so. Saying, you know, on a man-to-man -man basis, you got to give it to the Americans. And then he, he, he cites specific examples of the dignity and the valor of uh, the South Americans, uh, and the, uh, well, of the Americans, and how they were just, you know, uh, they were just tortured for, uh, uh, for not having enough gold. The streets of America are paved with gold, that's what Europeans were being told, and yeah, that rhymes. And they get over there and they stole everything they could, but they wanted more, they expected more. Um, they talk about the king of Mexico had long had long defended his besieged city and showed in his in this siege all that endurance and, and perseverance can do if ev if ever prince and his people did so when his bad fortune put him in his enemy's hands alive on the promise that they would treat him as a king nor did he in his captivity show anything unworthy of this title after his after this victory his enemies not finding all the gold they had promised themselves first ransacked and searched everything then set about seeking information by inflicting the cruelest tortures they could think of 
up on the prisoners they held and just destroying them, just viciously torturing them. They hanged him later for having courageously attempted to deliver himself by arms from such a long captivity and subjection, and he made a worthy end of a great soul of a of a great souled prince. Dying with dignity, showing inner value, matched against the trappings, the silly, gaudy uh, decorations of coaches, and he returns to that notion of coaches, and you know, being of no other use than for show and parade, like a chattel preserved from father to son by many powerful kings who were constantly exhausting their minds to make that great heap of vases and statues for the adornment of their palaces and their temples, whereas our gold is all in circulation and in trade. Um, the silliness of it, the cheapness of it, the, um, the pointlessness of it. He compares the, uh, the Americans collected gold and they would use it for beauty, which is where he began initially. They would use it for beauty and the Europeans would cut it up into tiny little pieces instead and use it to trade. Now, you can make arguments about the economics of this, but there is just on a simple aesthetic level where I think Montana is really working here. Uh, there is a sense of something lost there, of something cheapened, you know, metaphorically cheapened, uh, where they have no appreciation for beauty, the Europeans. They, you know, they're all after the gaudy and the glitz and the superficiality of it, but they can't see true beauty, which generally comes from in its most potent form within. And this is what Minten is lashing them for. Let us fall back to our coaches. Instead of those or instead of these or any other form of transport they had themselves carried by men and on their shoulders, talking about the Americans. That last king of Peru, the day, the day that he was taken, was thus carried on shafts of gold, seated in a chair of gold in the midst of his army, as many of these carriers as they killed to make him fall, for they wanted to take him alive. So many others vied to take the place of the dead ones, so that they never could bring him down. However great a slaughter they made of those people, until a horseman seized him around the body and pulled him to the ground. All glory to the vanquished. Montaigne sees this culture in Europe of the time that is devastating this new pair of continents on the other side of the world, and he doesn't like the attitudes that it's bringing out. He doesn't like the materialism, the um, greed, the inhumanity that it is fostering. He touches on it in certain uh, very powerful respects early on with cannibals and now with coaches he comes back and he just poof, he sticks the landing. He knows what he's talking about here. He's thought about these issues for at this point decades and He's ready to render a. Uh, he's ready to render a judgment, and it is damning. And along the way, because he was able to lay out this argument, it's not just him, because by nudging up to his final condemnation, he's bringing the reader along. He. Rhetorically, he keeps the reader close. He doesn't let the reader get too far off on his own. He doesn't let the reader necessarily just scan the data and come to his own conclusion. And at certain points, he sort of does. But he's presenting a very compelling case that nuzzles up to the reader and says, hey, let me tell you what's really going on here. Sometimes 
you know, uh, we're all human. We can be forgiven for certain oversights or lapses in, uh, in our perspective. But this is the world as I see it right now. And I think if you just bear with me for a minute, I think you'll see it my way too.